Um, <clears throat> so I still am amazed at where I am in my career. You know, I, I remember um, when I graduated from the University of Minnesota, um, I went to materials, it was uh, material science at the university, um, chemical engineering, material science. And, you know, I, I remember um, really trying to decide, okay, am I going to go to grad school and study photovoltaics, you know, really get down into it, or am I going to get out there and start getting it on roofs? And much to my wife's chagrin, I chose the latter. And so, but really, I, for a long time we bumped along and now I just can't believe some of the things that, that we've got going on. And that's what I'm going to talk with you about. So, but I'll, um, you know, I'm, I would say, I, I admit that I'm a nature boy. I, I spent a lot of time in the swamps, you know, chasing the muskrats and, uh, you know, smaller, you know, protozoa to look under the microscope and all. So, I've really been uh, tuned into the natural world all my life. And so, solar energy was something that I found that I didn't feel like I was compromising my, um, my ideals or maybe my, what's in my bones <laughs> um, too much. Um, and so, you know, things like this were going on in the 60s, you know, burning rivers. And, um, and so the environmental uh, damage of the way that we live was something that was, um, I was intensely aware of and really wanted to find a career that did not do that, or at least didn't participate in such a blatant way. Um, so the first thing I did, well, um, in, in the early 70s was, I, th I thought I was gonna be an orchardist. And when people say, how can you start a solar company in Minnesota in 1991? You know, there was no market. No, people were disgusted with, you know, what didn't work out in the 80s. But it's all on what you compare to. Planting an orchard was an utter disaster. <laughs> And so I met the gophers and the deer and the caterpillars and the droughts and, and in two years my trees were all dead. This is not my orchard. It, um, but um, so solar in Minnesota, that was easy compared to, you know, a drought. So I um, had to define success, however, because there was no market. So I decided that, you know, I, I was not a get-rich-quick scheme. Um, so really I wanted to be, um, you know, a local expert. I wanted to be a resource for the community and over time I wanted to build a team that could really deliver good projects. My background um, before going back to college, excuse me, was um, in construction. And so I wanted to be able to, you know, take those construction skills and the standards that I was aware of and, um, and make sure that those applied and that we didn't, you know, like have our compromise our standards and so um, also wanted to have a sense of belonging to you know this growing solar industry um, and of course wanted to help um, improve our relationship with the planet so starting a business um, was uh, there were three things that I um, really wanted to uh, um, were my my um, principles um, one was those accepted construction standards and we weren't going to compromise those. The second was to uh, leave a trail of happy customers because I knew from the 80s, from the solar thermal uh, debacle of the 80s, I mean I had a solar thermal system on my house and I can tell you my horror stories as well as anybody else's, um, but I wanted to leave a trail of happy customers to build an industry. Um, and then uh, with photovoltaics, I mean we were, even back then, we knew we were living at the mercy of the utilities who were being made to, you know, do incentive programs and support solar, um, in um, uh, in spite of what they wanted to do, um, in, or in spite of their um, uh, deep wisdom about the electric market, um, and so I wanted to cultivate good relationships so that we actually, um, you know, could maybe um, at some point in the future be working together to, you know, take over the planet and get coal out of the way and all that good stuff that we're tomorrow people are going to be on strike about. And, and what I thought of as a fourth one is that hire somebody who is better at each of the tasks in the business than I am. And I've been the fifth wheel in the business for quite a long time. And, um, and so I do have, so I've just been blessed by, with just a fabulous team. And so um, what I'll, the things that I'll show you are sort of that growing team. One thing I want to do is uh, to remember is um, Walt Brissett is sort of like when uh, musicians talk about, okay, who were your influences? 
Well, I went to a Clean Water Action Conference and uh, with the first gig that I did after I started the business, it was early 90s, and um, so figuring out how to set up a table and get my, inf my information on it. And Walt Brissett led a, um, a, 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 it was a session, a breakout session uh, in this Clean Water Action Conference in Minneapolis that I thought was just brilliant. And oh, as a matter of fact, I, I, I brought, I think there are actually, oh, I only made 20 copies and I thought there'd be, be way too uh, few, but I'm gonna pass, pass them out. Um, uh, this is a eulogy that I wrote for uh, Walt. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and you'll understand why I want to remember him when you read that. Um, so, a Native American activist, his beat was great, was Lake Superior, and empowering communities to actually fight pollution, like uh, train derailments that dumped chemicals accidentally, quote unquote, into the lake uh, and into the rivers. And so he was just tireless at um, protecting, and of course from Red Cliff Reservation is on the Bayfield Peninsula, which it's that little thumb of Wisconsin that sticks up into the lake. And so they were surrounded on three sides by water from Lake Superior. And so of course he would choose that, but um, he did an emergency naturalization ceremony um, for all these white people in the audience so that he could lead this session about a native view of um, you know, protecting the air and the water that I think just 60 minds, I think, um, you know, like became um, environmental warriors in, in the sense that he defined it for himself um, out of that. So, remembering Walt. So, I did, um, the, so this is going to be a joyride through uh, the solar cowboy days. Um, so, we, you know, in the 90s, it was only off grid systems, and I, we did things for the DNR and, the, um, and then the fabulously wealthy who could afford solar. Um, and had ideals. Uh, and so this was somebody that had a cabin up by Leech Lake. And this um, four Kyocera 51 watt modules probably cost more than, than a, a, a 10 kilowatt system. Now that's 200 watts. Than a 10,000 watt system. It probably cost more than a 10,000 watt system. The, but I mean, that's just part of it. The guts of it, this is my piece de resistance. It's a uh, box that holds the batteries and the inverters uh, that feed the power to the cabin that is porcupine proof. <laughs> that was part of the job back then was, you know, you had to, you know, do whatever was needed to make sure that even though those solar panels might last for 50 years, like we were telling people that, you know, the rest of the equipment would last for quite a long time too. Yeah. Question: um, We think about solar panels being about 20% efficient. What were they at um, I would say probably um, Kyocera was probably a leader, and they might have been 16%. And you know what they've done is engineering increments that you know less and less space between the cells, and better caulking or better you know so that moisture doesn't get into the um, the panel and degrade it. So incremental engineering things. And yes, that is me up there on the tower. I did small wind systems as well as solar in the 90s. Um, and um, <clears throat> let's see, people ask, you know, it's, a, it's seasonal, isn't it? And we go, yep, we work when the money's there. <laughs> and um, that was the season that the money was flowing. This was the, I did this partly for Doug's benefit, this. I met Doug when he, he, he had retired from Excel Energy. No, this was probably when it was, uh, yeah, just had become Excel Energy a couple of years before. And he was really excited about solar. And so he was one of the tireless um, helpers and volunteers that helped me install this 34 kilowatt system on the roof of the Green Institute, which was the largest system in Minnesota at the time. So, um, and you know, as far as quirky customers, um, here's um, just to have to show one, one type of quirky, I said fabulously wealthy with ideals. Okay, so um, you'd never guess what this uh, man does. He grew up on a farm in Minnesota. This is in Northern Illinois. And he is, um, and his, his uh, kids, his wife and kids are out there, um, you know, helping us. Um, this set of modules, 
um, is from roughly the same time period as the uh, four that I showed you up by Leech Lake. So you can imagine what this cost, um, probably 10 times what that one did, um, because it's 10 times bigger, right? Well, eight times. Okay, so um, what he did, what, well, this was about 1999. What he did for a living was he flew jumbo jets back and forth to Europe and then South America. And so it'd be three days out and back, and then three, two or three days on the farm where he'd like cultivate the corn and you know, like, you know, harvest the broccoli, whatever. And we were there for a week doing this and we had meals that were grown on the farm, all the food, the meat, the grains, the milk. Um, we only had one meal where we did not eat what had grown on the farm and that was when they had Kellogg's Corn Flakes one morning. <laughs> It was um, amazing, but uh, just in terms of quirky people with money, you know, and, and this is on the edge of his runway, because of course, uh, being in Illinois, he basically flew to work. He'd fly down to O'Hare and fly the jumbo jet and then fly home, park, and you know, go jump on a tractor. It was fun actually burying the cable uh, behind him because he was driving one of these ditch witches that sort of like uh, buries the cable two feet underground. And I was thinking, man, I'm following a jumbo jet pilot here as I'm feeding the cable. <laughs> It was, it was fun. Okay, um, one, one, another stop along the, uh, the market trail is solar shingles. Now this is unisolar. This was the first, uh, as far as I know, the first uh, unisolar shingle installation in Minnesota down in Northfield. Um, ha, are you familiar with the idea of solar shingles? I mean, oh, they've, very they're, they've been off the market now for uh, since probably 2014 or 2015 when Unisolar out of um, Michigan uh, basically went out of business. Um, really good product, really great. I loved it. It combined roofing. You know, it's a 40 year roof. Most shingles, it's a 20 year or a 15 year shingle. This was a 40 year guarantee they had on this. It had the best seal down, you know, for a carpenter to, you know, like to, like, um, under, to, to feel confident that you're putting something that's going to last for a long time. That was it. And then, um, you know, they doubled as a photovoltaic module too. So this is like, a, let's see, uh, one, two, three sets. So that was about a, uh, I don't know, a eight or nine kilowatt system. And um, well, you know, you kind of hope you get pole barns for doing um, some of these things. So you have these 18 foot long, you know, the same company, Unisolar, was a roll-off thing that uh, then would stick down. You had to go through a special training to um, learn how to wield that roller just right so that you didn't leave any air bubbles because with freeze-thaw, you would have air bubbles that would pop it off of the, the, um, the roofing. And so it's, it's basically, you know, 16-inch on center, um, a standing seam roofing, and it has to have seams that go up, not just these things that angle up and then angle down, um, just right in there. And so um, we got a castle. Actually, they hired us later to actually do the tower and um, kind of little mountain climbing expedition to get up there and roll these things out and meticulously roll the air out. Um, but that's still functioning. I've, we've replaced the inverters. Um, it was uh, some of the early Sunny Boy inverters. Um, well, one thing that, um, okay, the manufacturer promised me, you see all these little areas like, uh, oh, I guess, no, I shouldn't have done that. I should do this. Yeah, up here and up there. You know, there's these little areas where um, you know that you're not going to actually cut. You know, these things are photovoltaic modules, right? You can't cut a diagonal across it and have it function. So the, the manufacturer, Unisolar, was going to sell us a... Um, a carton of dummy rolls. Well, they promised us that for two years and I finally um, just took a little money out of another project that I was making a little money on and, and bought a carton of real, you know, like functioning shingles because it looked like hell and um, it wasn't what the science museum wanted. And so um, got live ones, cut those up, had to seal the edges, you know, because you were now uh, delaminating or it could. So these, 
Working, well, one of the things Unisolar taught me is working, they were a material science driven company because there's a lot of material science that goes into a, a, a solar shingle that is, um, it's a thin film, so it's not a, like we think of the um, solar cells as being like the refrigerator cookies where you make the um, roll of um, cell material and then you, you know, cut and then bake the dopants in and put the overlay on. Well, this was something that was sputtered you know, it's called sputtering um, on a conveyor belt. So as the material just goes across the conveyor belt, you sputter these different layers on that then create the, the module. And I thought, brilliant, you know, it's, you can mass produce it, yada, yada, yada. Well, um, being as they were totally science driven, they didn't know diddly squat about marketing. And so I, um, I learned the hard way that I, 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 I did like a dozen of these systems. And then when I was like really kind of ramping up, they sold, this is 2005, they sold two years of their production to a company, a roofing company that made roofing, uh, metal roofing in Germany. And if I wanted to get solar, uh, their, their product, I had to, um, I would have to buy a container load and have it shipped back across the ocean from Germany. Now, um, you know, when you don't know quite what you're going to be doing, even a month usually in the early market, um, a container load might have been like seven or eight years worth of, you know, the heavy duty marketing and uh, building up. So I wasn't prepared to do that. And it's, it really pulled the rug out from under me. And I, I've kind of lost some loyalty to a manufacturer that way and became more agnostic about what, uh, what the market could uh, deliver to me when I needed it, not when they wanted to sell me a container load. But that's been one of the problems in the solar industry is if you're a manufacturer and you're trying to ramp up, you know, you've got these guys like me that are out there selling onesie twosies and it doesn't create enough volume. You know, you can run for two weeks and then you lay everybody off for a month and then you run for another two weeks and then you lay everybody off. That doesn't work well for a manufacturer who wants to keep good people. So um, that, I mean, I learned a lot of business lessons just trying to deal with unisolar. Um, so and this is a photograph that Doug took. He was, uh, I think, uh, this is pre-drone, pre-drone. So I think he had his uh, pollinator wings on or something and he was um, out there. I think, no, it was a lift that he brought in. And that system, um, I learned the hard way there that um, really you get what you negotiate, not what you deserve. I, I left $70,000 in that system. I mean, they never were able to pay me and so, I, um, I didn't dwell on it, I moved on to the next thing, but um, you know, that, that was a lot of money in those days, this is 2004. <laughs> Were they willing to have all those shadows on all those modules, all those suboptimal <coughs> modules? You know, actually um, it looks like that, but there was enough space between them that I, I de designed that for um, December 21st. Okay. And you notice that there's a lot of space between the rows. The, um, the structural engineer we hired to review the roof uh, came back to me and said, oh, um, you know those, uh, all those bar joists under there um, were um, used. They were purchased, used from you know, some steel supplier and we've got no data on them. And so um, it would be inordinately expensive for me to cut, um, what do they call, um, you know, little chunks out of them and go to materials testing lab and test them. So why don't you just, uh, you know, just stay within like 10 feet either way of the support columns underneath and then just stay off mid span. Well, now the system has been torn off by the idiot who owns the building now and they put a 10K solar system on and they ran it all the way across. Like, did they even do a structural engineering? No. So why can't we just put them like flat? Why? Angling them. The panels, they are at an angle on one side, right? You mean, why not just lay them flat? Yeah. We weren't doing that back then. <laughs> the, the, the gospel was that you put it at your, uh, like, we're at 45 degrees latitude, so that you because put it at. It's only taking the sunlight from one side. If it is on the other side, then you are not oh, you mean um, run them the other way and so you can do them like that? Oh, there is also on the other side. No, 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 there isn't. Mm -mm. 
No. The other thing about the system was, uh, well, okay, I mean, there might be more to that, um, but I want to keep moving because I've sure. just got a lot of things. Um, this faces also, it's along Hiawatha Avenue in Minneapolis, and so it faces 25 degrees east of south. Um, and I, I remember Chris LaForge chiding me about, oh, you know, we're supposed to be installing these things facing south because you get the best performance. And we decided, well, we could put a lot more on the roof facing straight down rather than trying to angle them, especially having to stay off of areas like across the roof so that they face straight south. Also, this was one of the first commercial buildings that actually LEED certified in Minnesota. And it has a, um, um, it's a heat pump with a big field, you know, in the ground uh, around the building. And so um, what they're using is a heat pump to heat and cool the building. Uh, and so ground source um, heating, uh, when, when do you need, when do you have the surge of uh, heat requirement um, in the winter? You don't have one in the summer, got it, okay, yeah, we're into air conditioning there. But in the winter, you have that surge when people come to work at eight in the morning and they turn the thermostat up, or the system is programmed. Um, and so then you have that requirement for a bunch of heat. Well, and so the heat pump runs on electricity, and so the fact that it was angled towards the southeast meant when's it getting its best sun is about you know, 9 to 10 o'clock in the morning, on that winter morning. So actually, there were some things just architecturally that um, I thought worked with um, just what, what we had to do in order to get a good installation, which, you know, facing it southeast. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna fast forward through a whole lot of other things over the last 10 years or so, 15 more like, um, and talk about Lewis Industries, um, because really what, we're, we've, what we've always done was residential systems at, at IPS Solar, but the residential systems, um, you know, that market is, um, it's limited, you know, I've every, let's say, I, I, some of my salesmen will say, well, at best, maybe 10% of the buildings that I get calls, you know, to come and, hey, can we put solar on my building? Am I actually gonna try to sell them a system? Because the other nine out of 10, um, they didn't notice that there's a gable that, you know, just takes out 75% of the opportunity or the big catulpa tree in the backyard that they love and that the kids climb and, Right, now you're gonna put me, a, okay, are we gonna you know, shave the tree off? Are we gonna cut it down just so you can put solar? I don't think so. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm gonna say that it's probably 10% and less. So um, the market for solar on residences is, is great to, um, I mean, I love helping people go solar, but those other nine out of 10 need something else. And it could be that the place where they work it could be a solar garden that they subscribe to. So um, this was actually the first, although, okay, uh, honestly, this was a commercial industrial system, all 34 kilowatts of it. This is a commercial industrial system we installed in 2015, all 500 kilowatts of it. And so um, I'd rather have my salesman actually out doing things like this because this is gonna have a much bigger impact this is a metal fabrication plant. They use humongous amounts of electric power. They have three laser cutters that cut steel, thick steel. So um, I'd rather really enable manufacturers to use solar um, and have residential people do it when they can, but you know, work on their lifestyle, work on the vehicle they drive, um, you know, work on other things in their lives, and work, you know, work on eating organic food because agriculture actually puts more um, CO2 in the atmosphere than burning all the fossil fuels we burn. Um, so um, Lewis Industries was a great example to me of what we could be doing and so um, that one we, we learned um, actually an, another lesson here uh, what, that we learned was that um, if you apply um, the right kind of pressure um, you can get results from big organizations and so I remember I was, I was actually moving a, uh, well, we, we'd been waiting for, um, we had the design done. I had actually cleared the snow off the roof the previous winter, and then we waited for eight months for Excel to get the engineering approval, which really, if you put an engineer to work on it, would ha happen in a couple of days. So a little, 
you know, little wait period. And um, so we were, you know, all getting frustrated. But um, so I'm, I was up in, this is August, and I'm up in an attic moving a, um, uh, well, it's, it's the, the vent part of the plumbing stack that went right up through where we were going to put a solar array. So I'm moving this and I'm knee deep in insulation as I'm sort of doing my work. And I get a call from a reporter for the uh, Star Trib. And he's going, yeah, yeah, well, we're, I'm writing an article now about this thing up in uh, Painesville. Uh, and so it's just comical that sometimes you're just in this weird position of like, okay, I'm giving an interview that's going to actually kick Excel Energy in the ass. Um, and I'm standing knee deep in insulation and attic. How cool is that? I mean, that's, that's what I mean, you know, riding that bull in the beginning there. It's like, wow, what a job description. Anyways, um, the, the next week, the chief engineer, Sean Bagley for Excel Energy, called me and said, okay, let's get this thing going. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. Yeah, when can we meet? Yeah, what about tomorrow morning? Great, let's do it. I'm available. I'll come out of the attic for that. <laughs> so, um, good, good lesson though. And, and it was my salesman and the owner of the company, Leo Lewis, that actually, you know, got the, um, the, the Star Trib, uh, you know, um, sort of tipped him off that there was a good story there. <laughs> um, so what, what we're trying to do right now is to um, sell them storage. Um, you know, are you familiar with eGage? or with, with monitoring equipment that, that basically has a dashboard of some kind. So you can look on your computer or your phone now and see what your system is doing. So it basically CTs that just uh, uh, monitor the, um, the current, well, the voltage and current flowing out of um, the system and then maybe flowing from the utility so you can compare. And so we basically have had this e-gauge going since then and it keeps showing us that there's power being sold back. Um, that they could be storing and then using it when they're running second shift. So they could really say that, so what's the value of the power if you're selling it back versus the value of the power if you're actually using it for what you do? And so using it on site is typically gonna have a higher value than selling it back. Although because of um, Goosing XL, they gave um, Leo the best contract. This was 2015, so it was like 2013, the, um, the, the, the Minnesota Solar Jobs Act was um, really a, uh, it created a lot of new policy foundation for the solar industry, the community solar gardens. It also um, raised the um, net metering cap from 40 kilowatts where it had been since 1980 to a megawatt. But that was unexplored territory. The utilities around the state had really by 2015 not submitted proposals for how they were gonna do that um, whether they were going to have a sliding scale that ended up at wholesale uh, or avoided cost at a megawatt or whether they were going to have tiers or you know some other rationale. So Excel offered um, him a net metering contact contract where um, they gave him the capacity credit on his demand charge and then the like six or five cents uh, a kilowatt hour which is a commercial industrial account um, rate so basically they gave him the best deal on the demand charge, which actually um, was more lucrative than I'd thought when I was making my, you know, how, what's your payback gonna be type of projection. So um, they also let him keep his renewable energy credits, um, which for every program, any, anybody who's participated in an incentive program from the utility, you have basically had to, um, um, when you get the incentive, you're giving your, your renewable energy credits associated with your system. So every, a renewable energy credit, just so for those of you who maybe have never really um, dealt with them, is a, a, um, a thousand kilowatt hours of electricity. If, if you generate a thousand kilowatt hours of electricity, that's a megawatt hour, and that is, um, can be sold um, you know, on climate exchanges, uh, the Chicago Carbon Exchange used to, you know, have a price for that. And New York, there are people that buy them. And um, so there's a, dollar, there's a dollar value you can sell. I would consider it to be like the uh, foam on the head of the beer. You know, it's not the beer itself, but it's the stuff that's got all the smell of the hops. And, you know, so the renewable energy credit is something extra that you could sell. And so they gave him those, which was very unusual since they were giving him a good deal, you know, in their contract. 
Um, and since then, they've ratcheted down um, as far as what they're offering. Um, but what right now we're trying to do is to, um, you know, basically uh, justify using the um, the e gauge monitoring data that we have over the last, uh, let's say, four years um, to really show how much power is being sold back versus how much is being used on site and just say, okay, with a battery storage system about this big, you could store, you know, the, the power for three days and then, you know, use it on your second shift when the sun is low in the sky or down. Um, and okay, so the other uh, thing that we do a lot of is the community solar gardens. And the community solar gardens um, really have just been, it's, uh, the image in my mind right from the beginning is my team, we had our surfboards all pointed in the right direction when the big wave came. And so we all just like took off. Um, because, um, right, going from this, you know, which is a lot of solar panels, which, um, boy, I forget now how many it was. I mean, it was like 890 or something. No, 500 kilowatts, it was more like 1300 modules. Um, and this is five megawatts, um, and I think it's like almost 15,000 modules. And so you just get into this sort of statistical world where the individual module, um, so we have a lot of ribbon cutting ceremonies. Um, and so this one is right next to the Red Wing High School, which is uh, about where the middle of that picture of the people standing there is. Um, and so it's on Red Wing High School land. And so the high school is a subscriber to the community solar garden. Since then, this was one of the, this was the first one. Okay, lessons learned. I just love to uh, try to, you know, like each photo has a lesson learned. Well, this, um, so 2016 was were the first one that we installed and we had the dirt work done. And this, there's a lot of contour. You can see that undulation <laughs> off into the distance, a lot of contour going down into the woods and all that. So yeah, I got some slopes that are like this. And um, we had a 10 inch rainfall, just as you know, we had it cleared, ready to put the posts, or maybe the posts had been put in, but it was dirt. And up on the other end, there are some residences, like uh, where are we, up, up here. And there, they had um, mudslides that, you know, a lot of dirt ended up in their backyards. Um, we, um, we found out that you'd never leave the dirt on, you know, like vulnerable like that. So there are things you can do, and we do them. We uh, there's a um, like a, a line of um, it's 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 basically a, a, it's, um, a plastic mesh that keeps that the dirt can you know um, bump up. Or they can wash up against, but then you can take a front loader or something and then scoop it back. Um, so you gotta get uh, also plant matter underneath the modules as soon as they're installed um, so that you're, you're basically getting, holding the dirt in place. Because a lot of gullies developed um, during the time when we were building this too. And chasing gullies, boy, I'm just amazed at how, how much goofing around. I mean, you would think, okay, just go there and pile some dirt on it and stomp it down and then plant some grassy. Nope, gully just shows up again next time it rains because the dirt is soft there. So really, um, it's getting um, equi get, getting. Uh, so it actually drove us towards the pollinator pledge. You've heard of the pollinator pledge, and the um, what um, the fresh energy and other groups have been um, advocating. And so early on, we were thinking about okay, we got to get some things that get root, deep roots, like um, that uh, prairie plants do. And so uh, from that. Um, recognizing that a lot of uh, counties, um, particularly counties uh, where there are a lot of like towns where there are urban people who are not farmers, will decide, oh my God, we've got like all these uh, requests for um, com uh, conditional use permits for these developers who want to put um, solar gardens in. And we, what's the long-term impact? We don't know, but it's taking land out of prime agricultural use and it's, um, and we don't know whether that's a good idea or not. So they come up with moratoriums. Oh, well, well we're not just not gonna give any permits. You know who our best advocates are? Farmers who basically right now are suffering from tariffs on, Chinese tariffs on their corn and soybeans. 
um, uh, because their markets have dried up, or major markets. And boy, then you're gonna pay me a thousand bucks an acre for 10 acres to cut off you know, a little corner of my field? Do, maybe, maybe you wanna do two or three of these? You know, maybe we can do 50 acres. They're, they're, they're our best advocates down there at the, uh, um, the, um, the county um, planning commission meetings. Well, it, it'll only get better because you know, when you see the guy down the road getting you know, like a good deal for his land, you're gonna say, hey, well, how about my cornfield over here? <laughs> I've run into a lot of people who uh, didn't want to take agricultural land out of the back. But were they farmers? <laughs> See, a farmer is actually going to be the one that thinks about it the most and says, yeah, well, I'm the one that put it into production. Why am I not the one that can take it out? Is the government going to tell me i got to keep it in corn? It was a town of Warren. I don't know who owned the land. Yeah, well, CERTS, uh, Clean Energy Resource Teams, is, uh, has got a campaign going uh, right now of really getting farmers on board with um, you know, what, the opportunity, what the economic opportunities are for hosting solar gardens and for having solar you know, as part of their operations because they use a lot of energy and a lot of petroleum, a lot of natural gas. A yeah. thousand bucks a year? A thousand bucks an acre is, is per typically, year? per year, yeah. is typically what the lease is on, on a solar garden. You know what a farmer can produce on a chunk of land if they grow beans or cows? I don't know either. A thousand bucks an acre is is uh, it didn't come randomly. I'll say that. I mean, yeah. the idea was that you're going to offer them something better. And one thing that's better is if you have a 25-year contract for that, and there might be a small escalator in that so that it keeps up with the price of inflation or whatever. Yeah. Um, you're going to have a uh, a good um, um, stabilizer rather than the ups and downs of the, the markets that you got to sell into. You get a good harvest, everybody else did. Price just went down, you know, that kind of thing. Okay, well, I came here to talk about the Red Lake Solar Project, so I better. Um, so the driver, um, unlike the payback calculation that seems to be the driver even for people who are passionately want to save the planet, but, oh, what's the payback on that again? Um, is the fact that, um, okay, so uh, they're located up here in a part of Minnesota where there's, uh, because you've got the, um, the coal fields out west, the, the, the smoke goes up and then there's this plume of, you know, the particulates, the mercury and whatnot that come out. And so you have mercury buildup in, in the lakes. And so they have perpetual um, hunting and fishing treaty rights. Um, but what good are they if, the, if you can't eat the fish? So um, that's their economic driver. So I was really uh, thrilled to get called up there to um, do a feasibility study for them um, back in 2016. So their statement of vision is that they will replace what they use and they have three casinos and they have a big community up there um, with renewable energy. So what, what the first thing we did that I did uh, for the feasibility study. Okay, what is one aspect of the feasibility? It's what is the utility gonna say when you have a lot of solar? Well, you're gonna have to deal with them, so we might as well find out right away. So we had the three utilities that provide power, Beltrami, Red Lake Falls, and uh, War Road. And what Beltrami provides it for one of their casinos and then the rest of the community that's on the south end of the lake. Um, in California, they're calling it the duck. In northern Minnesota, we're calling it the loon. But this is the load curve that, uh, where people get up, they, go to, they, they, uh, they get breakfast and get ready, and then they go to work and school and somewhere else, go to their jobs. And then they have this uh, saddle, and then they come home and you know, watch TV and do things, um, um, cook. So, but when solar comes in, it's this awkward period right here. And so um, Beltrami just said right out, you can't even donate it to us because we've got a real problem. Because what they have to do is they buy power at, at this level to, you know, it's whatever their highest peak of the year is. They buy that all the time, 24-7, 365. And so when you see their load curve drop off like this, this is like un above this is unsold capacity that they're paying for and they have to f figure that into their price structure somehow. So they said, don't even donate it. We love you, but don't donate it. Okay, so what that did was that, that said, um, 
Okay, let's say for um, you know some building on the campus, just a random building, I, this is not a particular one. But if you're gonna use some of it immediately, you're gonna use what's, what the load is, is demanding, and then above that, you're, if you really wanna make a dent in, in the power um, in your electric bill, um, you're gonna store it and use it where the most value is. And of course, that's where a peak demand is occurring in the, and usually in the evening. So that's kind of the strategy that we went down. We said, okay, they don't, if, you're gonna, if we're gonna make more power um, than can be used at the moment, then we're gonna have to use storage. So I, I have 12 buildings in, in this, that I did the feasibility study in the community, 12 public buildings, schools, casinos, the government center and so forth. And they have, um, so each one of those, we, we're building solar I mean, and storage together. So for the Red Lake Casino, now these are actual numbers from the 15 minute data from their, their bills. On a typical day, uh, what, July 26th, so in the morning, you know, it's kind of, it, there's not a real pronounced peak uh, in demand. But when, when the solar, if you, if you actually put the, oh, so here's noon, one o'clock in the afternoon, solar noon, you know, in the summer. Um, so if you did a, a, three, a 400 kilowatt system, almost all of that would be under the, uh, the, the load. So you could be able to use that. But if you're gonna do two megawatts, let's say you wanna produce enough power to run the place most of the time, you're gonna basically need to store the rest of that. And because they have this driver that is not just a simple payback calculation, but it's like, you know, we don't want the mercury to build up too high in the lake, and we know we're responsible for some of that. So um, what they wanna do is set a good example for the surrounding community. And, uh, and get off of it themselves. So the buildings that we did the feasibility study, what I did was I said, okay, how much roof spot, top space do you have and how many kilowatts can you fit on there? And then how many kilowatt hours is that gonna generate You know, at uh, 1200 kilowatt hours per kilowatt? And then what is your usage from your build data? And so what percentage of your load will this cover? Um, so where's the shortfall? And then here's how much ground mount if you're gonna, because they got a lot of land. So the idea was that we could do some ground mount systems um, some places and make that up. They also have this big lake that um, on the east side, you can put some big wind, um, wind machines, and then you got the wind blowing across the lake, which is probably akin to what you find out in North Dakota. So um, the government center, um, they've, they've kind of reclaimed the eagle um, so the Eagle, we've, we've installed the, uh, the PV system behind the sheltering arms of an Eagle. <laughs> My daughter saw this photo and she, she's a photo she, she actually is an agent for photographers and, and so does, hires them for gigs for magazines and marketing campaigns for Coca-Cola and you know, things like that. So she said, that's an icon, dad. The tribe could do something with that. They could really, uh, you know, that could symbolize something. Well, so on the government center, we commissioned the first system um, back in December. It produces about 25% of the electricity. I hired Solar Bear, which is uh, Bob Blake. He's a uh, Red Laker who lives down here. And he hired most, mostly members of the Red, Band, Red Lake Band up there who were very construction savvy. Hired a master pipe fitter, a master electrician, you know, people that were good equipment operators. And so he had a great crew. I loved working with them. So I thought I was gonna have to do a lot of training well, no, basically it's just layout and then you know, turn them loose, make sure they can, you know, they all could read plans. So that was no problem. The financing issues caused delays because um, we, I just did the feasibility study. We had two financers that actually totally went radio silent. I, and I decided I didn't want to be part of a project. Remember um, the, um, uh, Walt Bressett from Redcliffe? I showed you his picture. Well, my, one of my heroes, I'm not gonna go, you know, and stiff uh, an Indian tribe <laughs> promising him solar and not delivering. So um, when six banks refused to make loans, I thought, okay, I was thinking I'd basically finance it by, you know, getting a few friends to put money together and then we'd get the loans. Well, my, um, the attorney that I was working with, Norm Jones, uh, was a local guy that uh, does a lot of this kind of work, said, well, well, we decided, well, why don't we have, like do crowdfunding you know, for the loans. So we got 23 microloans um, to raise $110,000.
and I have a loan repayment schedule of five years and I'm using the investment tax credit uh, that I get um, as the investor. So I put 15,000 in. Normally you wouldn't have that high a proportion of debt, but I'm paying two and a half percent interest. Banks, I would have paid 8% interest. So I'm getting it for a third or less of what I would have paid for the debt. Um, and then the micro lenders are getting five times what they get at the First Bank, National Bank of Bemidji or even in town here, you know, they'd be getting half a percent for that couple thousand in the bank savings account. So I'm paying two and a half percent. So it's a good deal for them, good deal for me. And that's why it worked. And so we're gonna do that again on the next building. Um, so the, the federal tax benefits we want to pass through to the tribe, just like we do for schools and churches when we do third party uh, financing arrangements. So it encourages local investment because you know you can get the little guy involved. Um, we flipped the ownership to Red Lake at year seven when we've gotten all the tax benefits and uh, use those to repay the loans. Um, but we also know that we need to finance energy storage anyways. And our model in solar for 30 years or 20 years has been you know trying to figure out how to get the payback period low enough so that the buyer will buy. Now you add storage, you're not adding kilowatt hours you're just adding more cost, right? And then they can move the kilowatt hours around, but you know, what's the value to them? Well, so I wanna explore those um, in order to like take some leadership in um, bringing financing uh, in to make um, energy storage possible in the solar market. Um, I wanna experience that from the point of view of a buyer. Okay, what kind of cost do I experience? What are the headaches? What are the benefits that as a buyer I experience? So I can talk about it. Um, from personal experience. So I, I'm really very happy to be in the position of the one that's actually just including it in the project that I'm the equity financer on. So the next one that we're gonna do now that we've done that first one is the Oshiki Ima Ajitada campus, which is their workforce development center. So, um, and they decided on that one um, now because they're training people and they can actually get some firsthand experience um, working with solar. And then again, we'll have um, Solar Bear um, take the, uh, so I'll, be, I'll do the financing and the design and development, and then Solar Bear will do the actual construction. So, we'll, so that one is about 200 kilowatts. Um, and so the main building will have a lot of the solar on it. And then there are two new buildings they just built. Um, and where they were welding program and some things like that. So we'll use the crowd investing again to raise about I'll put in probably 50,000 and then raise about 250,000. And we're gonna use Minvest this time instead of my church. So um, um, Lake Superior Solar is, um, the, the, okay, Minvest was a, a state law set up uh, oh, three, four years ago that um, allows, um, it's, uh, the, the Department of Commerce oversees it uh, and vets the, the, the deals that are being offered. Um, just to make sure that uh, they're kosher. And uh, then the Securities and Exchange Commission doesn't have to get involved, which makes it a lot more expensive. So um, it's a state program for crowd investing or crowdfunding. So, so that, that makes it clear that whatever at the bottom is the crowdsource? Yeah, you would go to the, and actually Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light set up the deal. Uh, they, they set up the, the portal um, on the, um, uh, on the Minvest website so that all you have to do is just go to www.lakesuperior.solar and you would see and we're I'm, I'm at the point probably by the, by the end of the day tomorrow I will have my offering up to the Department of Commerce they have a couple of weeks to vet it ask me questions and then it will go live um, hopefully the first week of October and then I'm hoping that we can raise the funds in you know a couple months and then be set up by materials to do the installation um, in the spring, probably March or April. So some of the other buildings, um, we did um, some artist conceptions, the Red Lake Casino. Thief River Falls Casino, this is, I mean, you know, they, they've got a water park, they've got the, the casino and the hotel complex. That's a lot, of, um, a lot of solar panels, but it's a lot of power use. So if we were gonna match their power consumption, um, Here's what we, the, okay, the, see that little tiny building up there? That's this. <laughs> so that's the solar field. And then we're talking about another one behind, about the same size, that we would use. And that would actually require um, 
probably on the order of 50 megawatt hours of uh, energy storage to store an adequate amount of the power so that it and actually one of the things that uh, I'll, uh, I'll mention here is that um, uh, they have a diesel backup uh, to um, take them through power outages which are frequent um, on the Indian reservation um, so resilience is actually one of the things that uh, that the battery storage so you have to size it not only for um, the ability to use a lot more solar uh, or wind but for have enough to glide through at least some outages maybe up to a hour long or two hour long power outage so I'm going to switch gears here and talk about uh, a couple other things that uh, about the market for solar I've got a couple minutes left um, so SIA has this um, chart here that uh, came out uh, at the beginning of the year that shows the uh, um, really the residential kind of levelizing and then commercial and indu industrial and solar gardens kind of doing the same thing and then utility really taking off so um, so the issues that I wanted to highlight here for the solar industry is that the utility narrative about solar dramatically changed this last year. Um, and maybe I'll just go to that then. So their narrative was always, oh, it's too expensive. We, you know, don't make us do it, uh, a bunch of it, just a little. Um, so at this last session, it was like, why are you doing all these programs that make it so expensive? Just let us do it. We can do it for a third the price. Wow, okay. Suddenly, the whole non-utility solar industry is irrelevant. We can go sell hot dogs now. Thanks. Okay, but did the hard work. Now, you know, we can all retire. So what, we, what the challenge is, I've been on the board of the Minnesota Solar Energy Industry Association for the last 10 years, and instead of just trying to incrementally improve what we can do with net metering and so forth, now we're in the position of proving the relevance of smaller scale solar. Because why don't we just let the utilities take it and run with it? So um, I would say that a starting point for us to talk about is that over the last 30 years, we have de-risked PV so that the utility scale solar is possible. I mean, all those lessons I told you that I learned, guess who's kind of riding along on my coattails? So that's one issue that, that we're um, dealing with. Okay, then energy storage on the solar market is, uh, well, okay, and I, to say something about community solar gardens. I think that we're on a slow uh, downward glide path because a lot of the um, larger good sites have been taken that are close enough to substations and whatnot so that we now have, um, uh, I know my business is kind of pivoting um, away from the big things in cornfields to let's say these storage buildings that you know will store you know like they're they're building them everywhere for storing you know all your furniture while you're trying to figure out how to sell your house because you're moving to an apartment and all that. There's so, a lot of Indy Basie stores you can store batteries in. <laughs> yeah, probably some JC Pennies too. So, and so there are niches that are going to be developing in the community solar garden market, you know, for more access to more people. Um, but really, uh, for us, it's been a stepping stone to um, PURPA, the larger uh, one megawatt to 10 megawatt scale projects, which are still on the distribution side of the um, utility system. That is, they're not on the generation side, on the other side of the substation. They're on the distribution side of the substation. Um, so that's kind of what, what uh, our glide path looks like. Uh, Mike Noble, the executive director of, um, of Fresh Energy, has, um, he's trying to come, um, get uh, engineer a, a grand deal between Excel Energy. And see, Melissa Hortman, who is the, uh, was the author, the principal author on the House side of the Solar Garden Law. And so the governor, Melissa Hortman, and Excel Energy all have this 100% clean energy by 2050. They have radically different ways of getting there. And so what Michael it wants to do is uh, give, make a grand deal so that um, Excel can, you know, do some RFPs for solar gardens so that they can help bring the cost down. And anyway, so that's something you'll hear something in the, uh, things in the press about. So this may be the last hurrah for the value of solar. Because the value of solar, if you think about it, there's this, um, okay, 
something I always used to bristle at when, when back in the days when I watched TV was when they would say, come down to our store and save a lot of money. Well, according to my checkbook, I actually wrote checks and I spent money there. But, you know, it's compared to what I suppose. But so the, the value of solar is like how much money will the utility save by, you know, putting solar in? They can defer investments, blah, blah, blah. Well, but eventually when we get enough volume of solar in the market, it's just got to be like everything else. Okay, how much did it cost to build? What do we have to sell it to the utility for? Um, and so the value of solar is either going to have to radically change to reflect that from the ground up rather than how much you're saving, or other models are just going to come up. And I actually wrote a paper, one of the first papers back in 2005 about value of solar. So I'm kind of... So, Okay, the, um, the thing about community solar gardens is if we top off at, le well, I was saying 800, but even if it's 1,000 megawatts, um, when Excel has um, got approximately twice what, see, they're saying it's way too expensive, but if you blend it in, they're going to do a whole lot more utility solar, according to that first chart I showed you, than the community solar gardens are going to do um, because they're just getting started on that. So as so they're kind of lying when they sell. Oh, it's going to be so expensive. It's going to have this huge impact on our customer base. Well, yes, early stage, but you can see that asymptotically it goes down. They're saying we're at 120. We're there at 40. Well, asymptotically it goes down to about 45. Not a big impact on their customer base. So this was something I showed um, to some legislators to you know try to get them on our side. Okay, so storage. Um, I think we need to have a shorthand way, uh, way of saying solar plus storage because that's hard to say. So dispatchable would be one way. We could probably have a naming contest. Um, but it's all about control. You're going to move the stored capacity to times and loads of highest value. Um, we have to make it financeable. So figuring out how to monetize all those grid services that we hear about. And then how closely do you have to pair it with renewables? Um, Ma Massachusetts has a peak demand program that they're rolling out where they've got three different ways of doing it which are kind of virtual PPAs where you can contract with the the um, the solar array might be two counties away but you're contracting you know with the same utility or in the same service territory um, you know to pair that up so you can do that under contract rather than having to have them physically right next to each other uh, so I'm going to skip that. Um, so, um, so if you've seen varieties of cash flows. Well, the, um, there are four things behind the meter that um, any one of these that you can get to light up basically improves your cash flow. So here are the benefits, you know, the tax benefits um, and depreciation, and here's your energy savings, your O and M costs. So um, your cash flow gets, you know, better and better as as the uh, um, as time goes on, but any of these that you can light up, whether it's providing backup, if you can monetize it by getting a contract with the uh, utility or the, the uh, owner of the building or somebody that's going to actually use one of those. Like with the Indian Reservation, we were talking about doing a lot more solar for the casino, right? So that one would light up. And then the backup value for power outages. So we're trying to light those two up. Maybe we can get the uh, um, and then and then we can get the investment tax credit along with that if we're using the solar or wind to, to charge up the batteries uh, for the most part. So um, that's how we're going to get the uh, um, make make energy storage financeable. That's the strategy. Um, and I want you to actually look at I could email this to, to anybody that's interested but um, the solar market um, is, I just think that we've, we've uh, our approach to dealing with the utility and non-utility is like putting them in a room together where they got about heads. We could actually be a lot more thoughtful about how they don't have to. One way is looking at a set of principles that we've talked about, like with some of the people at Excel. Um, one of the things is adding complexity to how they do business is a bad idea. Somebody else can take that complexity on and maybe they can do it more efficiently. Another thing is uh, uh, recognizing that they're very risk intolerant and that developers like me are much more risk tolerant. I mean, given the, the, some of my foibles that I've shown you, um, you know, I'm able to tolerate that kind of risk. And then having role compensation that um, clearly compensates for the different roles. So, I mean, this is a circuit board, but if you were to s just step back and imagine this is a town and these are all devices on so the platform the 
principle here is the clearly compensated role. Okay, so the platform, the utility runs, they already do that, that's the distribution grid. The developer like me puts the devices on that platform which are riskier. So they have the low risk position and then I have the riskier position and I have to have a formula that compensates me for taking on more risk. Um, so maybe an escalation in uh, the um, over time and contracts. So, so that's um, what I mean by clearly compensated roles. So the, the platform, so then they actually get to keep control of the system um, and that's a very important uh, thing for all utilities. So I'm looking for how to create, you know, right relationship. So there's my contact info and, um, and Bob Blake's also with uh, Solar Bear. He's an interesting guy. You should have him come and talk to. Any questions for Ralph? <clears throat> so uh, uh, the uh, old business case story goes if the uh, railroads, when you have the old railroad man, what he does, he says, well, we build tracks and we run trains up and down. And, but, if you had said, but if he had said instead, we move people and freight, then instead of spending all his money on okay. tracks and locomotives, he would have lots of trucks and trains. And uh, then he would have been, he wouldn't have become a railroad. My, my best marketing person um, said, don't sell what we do, sell outcomes. Show pictures of kids and dogs rolling around on a yard in front of a house with solar panels. Well, so, Mary Powell from uh, Vermont Public Utilities, so I'm sure you know, mm -hmm. um, doesn't say, I, I generate power and then I sell it to people. She says, I just make sure everyone has what they need. <laughs> right. And she has changed yep. the model. She mm -hmm. put Tesla power walls in people's houses for fifteen dollars a month, and what did she tell me? She says, "Now you have backup for your critical loads." But what she really did was she said, "You pay me fifteen dollars, and then you manage my peak demand." <laughs> so, Pretty good. Yeah. I mean, the people at Excel aren't idiots, so they could they could charge yeah. us to solve their problems too. So the idea is customer choice. You know that's a that's a big market force, and they talk about it. They you know you see it in the paper. Customer choice. Oh, we're playing to customer choice. Sure, yeah. I mean customer choice, but they still want to control the grid, um, and they should. They're the ones that built it. They're the ones responsible for the operation. So I don't want to take that away from them. I'm just saying that. And actually, um, a, a guy from Connexus, um, Brian Brandt, told me that um, they have no problem with third parties owning renewable energy, because that's the higher risk. So again, whoops, that's the pieces on that circuit board. They have no problem with me taking on more risk and owning those things. What so Brian put his batteries in and he, re and he eliminated his demand charges, his, his risk position's gone. Well, actually the, they have other risks, which I mean, maybe we, we shouldn't go into now, but oh yeah, no, he, the, the risks are of like community um, let's say disenchantment with with various things they do because there's always somebody trying to kick their butt. One more question. Could you talk a bit about energy storage technology? I assume we've gone beyond lead acid and maybe lithium. Is the Tesla power module where we're going? Where we're going? Well, um, yeah, okay. Um, so for energy storage, think of um, the large, I'm going to think of it from the perspective of a municipality now. Largest single load that a lot of municipalities have, small towns and so forth, is pumping water and sewage. So where does the water go up to that water tower? So that everybody gets water pressure. That represents an enormous amount of lifting, right? There's all electric motors that do that. So um, pairing um, solar and storage well, the thing is, we, we've gone down that road and then we said, wait a minute now, water, MGH, for anybody that studied physics, is, is uh, what we've got here. You know, we've got storage, we've got energy storage by having the water up there. So we want to pump it up there. And I, I remember meeting with somebody from the Minneapolis Water Department to talk about, you know, okay, what are your patterns? What are your use patterns, okay, for when people come home and then turn everything on, you know, they cook and whatnot. So there are times of day when the um, when the water usage goes up and then when it goes down so you've got peaks they're not the same as air conditioning load peaks but um, you can actually uh, use if you uh, just 
kind of develop that storage uh, capacity um, intelligently or, or the patterns of how when you charge it up you can do that with renewable energy and so I like to think of um, that we have a lot of other alternatives besides batteries. Um, a water heater, like uh, we were going to, okay, so one of the things at the Oshkima Ajitada building, the Workforce Development Center at Red Lake, is the fact that they have, um, you know, they, they're at the epicenter of propane use in Minnesota because they don't have natural gas lines up there into that area. So um, they use a lot of propane. Well, that's a fossil fuel, right? It doesn't probably put mercury in the lake like coal in Montana does, but it's a fossil fuel. It puts that carbon in the atmosphere. So um, we were thinking about uh, using uh, electric water heater to store, um, if, if there isn't that much energy um, and they don't have use patterns where they've got, like at that workforce development center, they have a deal with the, um, the co-op where they don't have a demand charge. So there's no economics there at all. Um, but what they do have is this water heater that burns propane, right? So if we store extra energy from the solar in hot water, we're, we're minimizing the use of propane. And so it's, again, it's the highest, um, um, let's say, impact, the best impact or the highest value um, type of storage for them at the lowest so cost too. When you store it, and you, I mean, when you have excess energy, that's when you store it in water. Right? Yeah, right. When there's excess energy, because if there isn't, I mean, excess is by definition you're not able to use it right away. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry to bring this to an end, but we could obviously go for a while. Let's give Ralph a hand. For the <laughs> uh, thank you.